Hi, welcome to my neighbor Tom's farm. I'm down here helping him with morning chores. Once we're finished, he's gonna help me go pick up my new horses. And then it's time for a birthday party for all four of my nephews. For the ingredients to their chocolate beet cake, I'm headed down to Nordic Creamery in Westby, Wisconsin for some goat milk butter. And then it's off for a quick visit to the Driftless Folk School. And then I'll be gathering some beets from my friend Steve's root cellar. Gather with us around the farm table. I'm your host, Inga Witcher. Good morning, girls. I'm Inga, and I love everything about farming. Midwestern farms are a bounty of good food made by good people. I love being able to travel to search out good ingredients. Cooking is all about what's seasonal, what's fresh. Every day can be filled with good food, good friends, and a beautiful herd of cows. Welcome to the farm. Good girl. Around the Farm Table is funded in part by Quick Trip, big on fresh, and proud to support Wisconsin's farmers. Wisconsin Farmers Union, united to grow family agriculture. American Provenance, Heartland Credit Union, and Friends of Wisconsin Public Television. Farming is all about neighbors helping neighbors. And today, my neighbor Tom is gonna help me pick up these horses. Let's go get them. Tom and I couldn't help but reminisce on our ride to pick up the horses. He and his brothers had horses growing up. My brothers and I shared Pepper, our Shetland pony. Pepper was as stubborn as they come. Tom and I also reflected on the early days of his farming. I asked him how he overcame the challenges of farming alone. Neighbors, he said. I guess some things never change. Well, maybe I'll turn you back into a horse man. A nice horse. It is nice. Joy, these are beautiful horses, and these are Welsh cobs, right? Yes. What is the Welsh cob known for? Mostly driving. They're work horses. They drive at Disneyland. Oh, they nice. They use them in the carriages there. And these are kind of almost ponies. They're just yes. large ponies. Yes. That's good. And they're going to have a good temperament, right? These guys do. <laughs> good. They really do. They're very friendly. They're not mean, usually. Good. Well, I'm excited to bring them back to my farm and, and let them run around the pastures at St. Isidore's Mead. Well, one thing I'm a little bit nervous about is getting them home and getting them comfortable. What do I need to do to introduce them to me and to the farm? Spend time with them. The best thing you can do is spend time. Okay. And just walking them around and Walk just them around, petting them. Pet them, sit out there, read a book. Don't abandon them. Okay. Because they don't have any idea what's happening. Yeah. And they're going to be happy because they're together. Our horses, I know with my cows, I like to have, they're better in groups. Is that the same with horses or can you keep just one horse on your farm? You can keep just one horse, but they are a herd animal, mm -hmm. so they do prefer to be with other horses. I was doing a little bit of research on these. They're kind of known for that working horse. So and I know these ones were driving, they're used for driving. Mm -hmm. um, it, can any horse be taught to, to drive or pull a wagon, or is it only special breeds? I would think just about any horse can be taught. Mm -hmm. It's just their temperament and what they'll tolerate. Okay. That's what these guys are mostly for. Yeah, he's already being really friendly. <laughs> he likes people. <laughs> I'm hoping that they're not going to get too nervous about the smells of the farm and the, the, the cows and, and, you know, just being there in that atmosphere. So I'm hoping to make them feel nice and calm as soon as they arrive. Feed. What do I need to think about with feed? Hay. Good quality hay. Mm -hmm. um, fresh, clean water. A salt block. That's all you need. They're easy keepers. This is a lot easier than dairy cows. <laughs> well, I, I'm sure it's not. <laughs> and then uh, any advice that you can give me just as it's been a while since I've had horses, so I'm kind of out of practice. Just spend time with them. Everybody will tell you different things you need to do. For as many horses as there are out there, there's our opinions. So you just have to figure out what works for you. Okay. Well, Tom and I are going to take these back to my farm, and then I'll meet you in Westby, Wisconsin, where we're going to pick up some goat butter for the birthday cake. Horses have a mind of their own, and Dylan and Merlin were none too eager to get into the horse trailer. But patience and a calm demeanor paid off as the horses finally got on board. 
Now these two black beauties are off to the farm and the organic pastures. And I'm off to gather ingredients for the birthday cake. Won't my nephews be surprised? My friend Al picked me up near Westby, Wisconsin to give me a little taste of what it might be like with my ponies. Not only is he a horse enthusiast, but he's also an artisan cheese and butter maker. And today I'm here at Nordic Creamery to learn how to make goat butter. Al, this farm has been in your wife's family for quite a few years. 100 years this year. That's amazing. I love hearing about these 100-year-old farms because so many farms are disappearing from our landscape, I think. And to see that the farm has been passed down from generation and that's still thriving, it makes me really excited. Yeah, we're pretty proud of, uh, of what we've done on the farm here, building the plant uh, about seven years ago, uh, hoping to have something to pass down to the next generation. Uh, we've got six children, so we, we want to have something that they can enjoy and, and hopefully make a living at. That's wonderful. And I think it's important to, it's, there's a sense of security by turning that milk into your own product, isn't there? And, and knowing that uh, you, you can regulate your price. The milk price is so fluctuating these days, it goes up and down. And this is a nice way to secure your market. Yeah, we make a, you know, a little unique product here and there and uh, demand a, a pretty nice price for it. But most of that is passed back down to the farmers so they can also make a living too. Sure. One of the reasons I like buying locally, we have so many great cheesemakers here in Wisconsin, is because you're you're giving the money back to them, but which they're in turn giving their to their community. So it's all staying together, which I think is just how the food system should work personally. Yeah, we're all in this together and we all need to kind of make a living and, and have fun while we're doing it too. What got you interested in horses and driving? A couple of years ago, we decided to uh, get our first team of draft horses. And uh, since then, we've added a few more and a few more and a few more. And uh, we really enjoy it. So how many horses do you have right now? We have almost 30 horses now. So you have no extra time in the day to do anything? Uh, no. It, you start out with six kids, you know that time is uh, <laughs> not an issue there. So, uh, yeah, we, we're busy. Well, what do you hope to see the creamery happening? What, do you, what are your growth goals in the next 10 years? Well, uh, you know, we have some projects coming up, uh, some new product that we're going to put out there. Uh, and we want to keep making the, the staples that we have uh, some really nice product that uh, people really do enjoy. What's your favorite part about making cheese? Just to, to take the raw product and turn it into something that uh, people out there can enjoy and uh, know where it's coming from and, and what we, the hard work we've done to make it. Well, wonderful. Well, I am so excited to learn about goat's milk butter in particular, something I never really heard of before. So why don't we head on out to the creamery and Al's gonna teach me how to make goat's milk butter. Thank you so much for giving me a ride on these horses. It makes me less intimidated just to drive my own. It's my pleasure to pick you up out here and bring you into our nice little plant and give you a little tour. I'm excited. Al, it's been about 15 years since I made butter in this scale. Can you tell us what the process of making your artisan butter is? So we're gonna add the cream to the churn. Um, we're gonna get her closed up here and uh, start it up and it's gonna take about 15 to 20 minutes for this to churn. Alrighty. Uh, and then after that, we'll drain the buttermilk off and uh, add the salt. We'll start it up. All right, here we go. This is quite a bit easier than doing it with a mason jar, which is what I do at home. This is a lot easier process to do it this way than that way, yes. <laughs> so after we get it churned for about 15, 20 minutes, what's the next step? After we churn it, uh, we wait for the butter to separate from the buttermilk, and then we want to drain off the buttermilk, and then we're going to add salt to it, and then we're going to work that salt into the butter and then take it out and package it. That's fantastic. It's, it's so simple. <laughs> Now, you're one of the only artisan butter producers here in the state of Wisconsin. We have a lot of artisan cheesemakers, but why are there not more artisan butter makers? The state of Wisconsin holds the butter makers to a pretty strict standard, and it's kind of hard to get that license, so it's pretty hard to uh, get a lot of people that want to go through that. But artisan butter is so good. 
artisan it's butter so is great to taste the difference in the seasons of the butter uh, going from spring to summer and summer to fall. Uh, it's uh, wonderful. There's a lot of butter that's uh, made and froze uh, to use at a different date. Uh, we try to make our butter fresh, uh, get it out there as quick as we can so you can taste that freshness and uh, the change of the seasons in the butter as well. And this is goat butter, which is something that's very unique. How did you decide to do a goat butter? So goat butter will be a lot like uh, goat cheese, where the people that are a little lactose intolerant or have a little trouble with lactose can take the goat butter and use it for their butter instead of the cow butter, and it'll digest in their system a little easier. Well, I can't wait to taste it. Why don't we finish up here? I'll help you uh, load up some packages, and hopefully I can take a sample home with me. You bet. This looks great. I'm gonna help Al package up this beautiful butter. Why don't you head on over to the Driftless Folk School and I'll meet you there. It's wonderful to be out here today. Can you explain to me what the Driftless Folk School is? Sure, the Folk School is a little over 10 years old now, and it was initially a collective of people in the area that had a passion for some expertise or skill they had they wanted to share and preserve. So the school is trying to preserve those knowledge, pass them on, promote them, and initially there was no campus. Uh, it was just people that would conduct classes in their home or in a public place. But a little over two years ago, uh, they got into a partnership with Bear Creek Farm, and now we have a five-acre campus. We're slowly building infrastructure so that more and more things can happen here, like the cabin. That sounds exciting. What kinds of classes ha have you offered in the past? It's a wide range and usually has to do with crafts or skills or ho homesteading type things. Uh, some of the classes I've taken are deer butchering, chicken butchering. My wife's done fermenting. Uh, I did some pr tree pruning to learn how to keep my apple trees in shape, so a, a wide range. These really sound like skills that perhaps my grandparents would have passed on to me. And it's nice to know, since they didn't pass these tricks on to me, that there's a place where we can relearn these amazing skills. You know, I was raised on a farm, but it was a conventional farm. And I think some of these things kind of skipped a generation or just didn't get passed on the same way. So now that I live here, I'm excited at all the classes I can take and learn the things I should have before. One thing I think that it's great about the school is that you're learning from your neighbors, your peers. There's not these sort of academics coming in to, to teach you these labor sense of things. You're working right alongside your neighbors. There's definitely a community piece to it. Uh, locally, in the Driftless area, there's an attempt to relocalize, let's say, and, and create community, and that's part of what the school would like to do. Uh, but people can sign up from anywhere, from, from large cities, come here for a weekend, uh, and that's, that's kind of community also. Uh, again, these were people in this area that all happened to know each other, connect, and, and create this, this school, but also to be a, a resource for the area. And, and it doesn't just have to be local community. People come here from pretty far away sometimes, and then that's another form of community. It's a common interest. I love that. I'm about two hours away from here, and there's definitely some classes that I'm looking forward to taking this summer, and I don't mind driving down, because there's skills. Chicken butchering, I just, I love this, and I want to bring all, uh, people with me so they can learn these skills and come back and help me butcher chickens. But in the meantime, what I really came for is to learn more about root cellars, and I know that you have a root cellar. I think it's a wonderful way to keep food throughout the winter, and I'm hoping that maybe you could show me yours and just teach me a little bit more about it so that I can build one at my house. I'd love to do that. Wonderful. Well, let's take off. Steve, this is an inspiration to see all the wonderful food that you've been keeping up here and to be in your root cellar. I'm really inspired to do a root cellar in my basement, and I know that ventilation is key. Can you explain what I need to be thinking about when it comes to ventilation? Sure. Sure. Two things to, to ventilation. First off, you need to make this area cold, as cold as you can. So you need cold air from outside to be able to get in. And then secondly, for root vegetables and things that aren't dehydrated, they need to have high humidity, but not so wet that they'll get boldy. So you need air movement, but it needs to be cold, humid air. 
So that's why, for example, on these bins for potatoes and things, I've got slats for air. So air movement all Air the movement. Time. You don't pile them too deep. That's why there's m several different layers. Okay. Same thing for other root crops. All right. Now, do you have to take any air out? When you have a root cellar that needs that air movement, yeah, you need air in and air out. In this root cellar, I added a second line to bring cold air in, and then this vent is where the warm air gets pushed out. And what's the optimal temperature for the root cellar? It depends on the vegetables. Some, some like it really cold, just as close to freezing as you can get, and others not as cold. But in general, you want it cold. But how do you deal with the different temperatures in the space? Yeah, root cellar have zones, and, and you, it takes some maybe putting thermometers to see where exactly things are going on. But down low will be the colder stuff, so stuff that likes it cold, you, you put in the lower bins. Uh, that doesn't need it as cold, you put them in the higher bins. This, this is a... a squash and they don't need it super cold. They, they're a good storage crop, but they don't need it so cold. Hmm. This is really inspiring and I have not been doing my due diligence when it comes to storing food. So this looks like it's taken hours and hours of your and your wife's time. What is it about putting your own food away that is important to you? Well, there's several things. Just, just the feeling of accomplishment, but you know where your food's coming from. Uh, you want to live a more sustainable life, grow your own food, and um, you can extend the season for how long you eat your own food. It's great to have tomatoes in the summer, but a lot of this food will be eaten all year. And I bet it tastes a lot better than you just go to the grocery store. It does. It does. <laughs> well, I was wondering if I could taste some of your beets that you've been storing. I'm planning on making a birthday cake for my nephews. We still have some beets left. Well, fantastic. Well, I'm going to get the produce, and then why don't you meet me back at the farm where we're going to make up a beet chocolate cake. I stopped off on the way home and picked up my youngest nephew to come help me make the birthday cake because he loves making cakes with me, right? We've made quite a few. What's your favorite kind? Beet. Beet cake? I think he's just trying to get on my good side with that one. Well, today we're gonna make a beet cake because it's a lovely cake to have this time of year. It's a great way to use up those beets that are in your root cellar and it's a way that I can get my nephews to get a little bit more vegetables in their diet. You probably have most of these ingredients on hand. It's a very simple recipe. We're gonna use some eggs, a little bit of salt, some baking powder, some goat's butter, brown sugar, flour, and two cups of pureed beets. Now for the beets, what I did is I wrapped them in foil with a little bit of olive oil, popped them in the oven at 425, and let them roast for about an hour throw them in a food processor and process that down. Remember to scrape your sides so that you're getting a nice even puree. So we got the brown sugar in here and then this goat's butter. I'm excited to be able to use goat's butter. I don't think that I've ever eaten it before and I love it that now I know where to, I can find it locally. Do you know when I was a kid, I would often go to my grandma's house just like you do and I would bake all the time. So what we're doing here is we're just gonna get a nice cream on that butter and the brown sugar and it's gonna look a little coarse at first but just keep going with it and get it nice and mixed in. All right, Ashton, that looks good, I think. So the next thing we're gonna do is add three eggs, one at a time. Mix the eggs in well before you add the second egg. So you, I know that you're the egg cracker king. Can you crack me an egg? It's important to be able to cook with my nephews and cooking with kids is, should be important to all of us. It's a great way to establish that passion of cooking for them as they grow up and become adults. And hopefully when they become adults, they'll want to cook at home more, hopefully healthy meals, and maybe even with ingredients from their own farms. We're gonna cream this all in so it's nice and incorporated. You wanna chop your chocolate up as small as possible so that it melts faster. And then in with the chocolate is a quarter cup of the goat's butter. And this is gonna be a delicious ch chocolate mixture for the beet cake. Melt your chocolate using a double boiler. A double boiler is essentially a pot with boiling water on the bottom and then a smaller pot that, that just fits right in there. And that's gonna heat gently that chocolate, making it nice and luscious. Once your chocolate's melted, set it off to the side so that it can cool slightly before we use it in the recipe.
Now, once the vanilla is in here, you can add your beet and chocolate mixture right into your bowl. And be sure to have a big bowl when you're making this recipe because there's a lot of it. And so it's kind of surprising how much, how much this will fill your bowl. You want to start swirling that around? Get it mixed in. Well, good. All right, let me give you a hand to speed this up. We can do it together. Look at, oh, I love spending time with my nephews. I realize that I love it more than they do, but I still love it and they still put up with me. Once the beet mixture's mixed in, then you take your baking powder, pop that in with your flour, and then your pinch of salt there. I think it's about a quarter teaspoon of salt, I'd say. And then adding a little bit at a time, we'll mix in the flour. You wanna help? We can do it together. We do a lot of fun things together. We milk cows together sometimes, feed calves. What else? You've done a lot of fencing with me. Not, I don't think in the recently, but when you were a baby, you'd come and sit out in the car with me in your car seat and take naps while Papa and I got all the fencing done. I've decided I'm gonna put this into a bunt cake. I like the shape of it and it's kind of unusual. And the other thing is the bunt cake pan was invented in Minneapolis. So I thought it was kind of a nice little local touch to our local birthday cake. Okay, and now we'll just add the last bit of the flour mixture and the color of this cake. It's my favorite batter to make because the color is just amazingly beautiful and vibrant and it really has that beet color. And it will have a, have a like a, just a subtle beet flavor to it too. If you didn't know you were eating a beet cake, I'm not sure that you'd know there were beets in there. Let me finish it up there, buddy. And now that everything's mixed up, we can just put it right into our bunt pan, making sure to get it around evenly. Can you scooch this for me when I ask you to just do that? All right, give me a scooch. Thank you, sir. Give me a scooch. Scoochy. Keep scooching. Let me get the rest out of here. Yummy. Does it look good? And then smooth it out so that it has a nice surface here. And I don't know if I'd mentioned this, but I have some cocoa powder that I dusted the pan with. That way it'll give it, if you use regular flour, uh, all purpose flour, you can kind of leave it, leaves a white residue. So with using the cocoa powder, you don't have that white residue. All right, now I'm gonna pop this in the oven at 375 for about 45 minutes. Uh, let it rest for a little bit when it comes out of the oven for about five minutes and then flip it over to get it out of the pan. And I was thinking of put, putting a nice icing on the cake using a little bit of powdered sugar, some beet pulp, and a little bit of milk. And I have to get it to the right consistency. I don't want it too, too drizzly and I don't want it too thick. I just wanna coat the cake with a nice pink icing. Okay, well let's get this in the oven because I see the brothers have just arrived. Are you excited about seeing your surprise? Are you? Well, thank you so much for helping me bake the cake. Mm, I know how much you love kisses. And why don't you jump on down and head out and go greet your brothers. I'll get this cake in the oven and get some dishes done and then it's time to see the surprise. I finished baking the cake while the boys were outside and now I'm ready for the frosting. It's an easy recipe with only three ingredients, milk, powdered sugar, and some beets. So let's quickly whip that up. Start with about a cup of powdered sugar and then add a little milk until you get the consistency that you desire. A thicker frosting means less milk. If you want a lighter coating, then add a little extra. Once you get the icing to the consistency that you like, then you're ready for the final ingredient, beet pulp or pureed beets to give it that rosy color. Add the beet paste to your frosting mix and give it a stir. When it gets to the consistency you like, drizzle that frosting all over the chocolate beet cake. Looking good, and there's nothing like homemade birthday cake. Now it's time to head out to the stables to show my four nephews the newest addition to the farm. It's a big surprise, look what we got for the farm. Horses! Who's excited for horses? Me! Yeah. What do you think? Yeah. Happy birthday to us! Happy birthday to us! One, two, three! Sure to be a new birthday tradition. Rich and moist, chocolate beet bundt cake.
vanilla ice cream, and chocolate beet cake. They're made for each other. The boys love Grandma's gingerbread horse-shaped cookies. There's nothing better than a glass of ice-cold milk to toast a birthday. Did you guys have a good birthday party today? Yeah. <laughs> well, I hope for your next birthday party, you'll consider this chocolate beet bundt cake. And I hope you'll gather with us next time around the fire table. I'm your host, Inga Witcher. Cheers, guys. Around the Farm Table is funded in part by Quick Trip, big on fresh, and proud to support Wisconsin's farmers. Wisconsin Farmers Union, united to grow family agriculture. American Provenance, Heartland Credit Union, and Friends of Wisconsin Public Television.